I am a believer, an unerring believer, that the Bible that we have is the Word of God. That there are no errors in it, that it was given to us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, by men to write the Scriptures. Now there are different translations that are out there and uh, some folks are fine with one translation, other people are fine with other translations and, 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 and I'm just fine with that because translations are just that. They are interpretations of trying to translate a language into a language we can understand. And we all know that uh, there's different ways of doing things and, and, and you've heard me talk uh, before just about the word love. In English, we have love. But in Greek, there are five different words for love. And so, you know, it doesn't bother me about translation. Some people, you know, like one, some like the other. As long as it is a translation where scholars have tried their best and linguists have tried their best to bring it into a language that we can understand, I'm completely fine with it. But I do believe the original writings are 100% inspired by God. But having said that, if you look in your Bibles, in most Bibles, before each chapter or before a piece of Scripture in chapter, it will kind of give you a suggested topic. It will kind of give you a suggested topic about what the publishers of that Bible think that that passage of Scripture is all about. Well, this morning I want to challenge one of those. I am not challenging the Word of God. I am not challenging the contents of the Word of God. But I want us to look and think from a different perspective this morning. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Luke chapter number 15. Luke chapter number 15. If you have your Bibles with you this morning and you're looking there, does your Bible give you a kind of a topic about what's happening there in Luke chapter 15? Does it give you a topic? Does anybody, a subject? Parable of the lost sheep. Okay. Now, let's go down to verse number 8. What does your Bible suggest the topic of that is? The lost coin. And if we go down to verse number 11, what does it suggest that's the topic? The prodigal son. The lost son. Well, this morning I am going to challenge our thinking for just a moment that this chapter is not about sheep. It's not about coins. And it's not about sons. This chapter is about a shepherd about a woman, and about a father. And they are all pictures of God. This chapter includes stories about animals. It includes a story about an inanimate object, a coin. And it includes a story about a lost son, but if we focus on those three items, I think we're missing the most important part of this passage of Scripture. I think we're missing the most critical part of this Scripture. We're going to read the whole chapter this morning, so I'm going to ask you if you're able to stand in honor of God's Word as we read Luke chapter number 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. 
So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what of a woman having 10 silver coins? If she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the one coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the young son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your commands. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, he who, was the, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours." It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Let us pray. Father, we come this morning and Lord, I thank You for Your Word. God, I thank You for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that led men to write down Your words. God, I ask this morning that we would examine Scripture in light of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we would read the text for what it says. 
Thank You, Father, for loving us. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. As we take a look at this passage of Scripture this morning in Luke chapter number 15, what has happened, what is is happening, and the, the very first couple of verses gives the context of that, it says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Him. Would you believe it or not that Jesus spent time with sinners? He didn't just spend time with the righteous. He spent time with sinners. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Basically, they were saying, if if He is the Son of God, if He is who He says He is, He should be too good to spend time with sinners. He shouldn't be spending time. What they were doing was accusing Jesus of not being the Son of God. They were bringing accusations against Him because He said, I am the Son of God. I am God. They're rebelling against Him. They're rebelling against His Word and they're saying, well, if you were the Son of God, you would be too good to eat with sinners. And here is where Jesus gives His explanation. He gives it in three different parables. And through the years and what we have traditionally seen, it is the parable of the lost sheep. It is the parable of the lost coin. And it is the parable of the lost son. But more importantly in this scripture is who, is, who these people are represented by. And that is God. In the first story that Jesus told about a sinner... And he told them a parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one, does not leave the ninety-nine back and goes and seeks after the one? Here Jesus is telling a story that in order to save sinners, in order to show sinners love, in order to bring sinners back home. The shepherd has to go seeking the lost. The shepherd has to go seeking the lost. Now let's think about this shepherd for just a moment. This shepherd left the 99 that were together. Not many of us have experience with sheep. Maybe none of us have experience with sheep. Maybe we have experience with cows, goats, horses, pigs, chickens, ducks. But I dare say there's many in here that have experience with sheep. But sheep are animals that flock together. Jesus left the 99. The shepherd left the 99 because they were going to stay together and went after the one that was lost. Here we have a picture of God's infinite love seeking out lost man. Remember all the way back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned and they realized they had sinned and it was the time of the afternoon that God was coming down to the garden to fellowship with Adam. He had a regular appointment every afternoon that he fellowshiped and he walked with Adam. And that day that he came, Adam and Eve were hiding. And God said, where are you? Even from the very beginning, God sought the lost. God sought the lost. In this parable, if we talk about the sheep, and we can learn lots of things about the sheep, and we should learn lots of things about the sheep, but if it was not for the shepherd, the story would have zero importance. 
If it, if it were not for the shepherd that went out and sought the lost sheep, the story would have zero importance. And Jesus goes on to finish this parable and he says he went out. He sought that lost sheep. He put that lost sheep up on his shoulder and he brought him back to the fold. And many rejoiced because of that one that was returned to the fold. God seeks after lost souls. The Bible says, Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There are no exclusions. There are none that are beyond the scope of God seeking them. John 3.16 For God so loved the world. God so loved the world. That includes every man, every boy, every girl that has ever lived or walked or taken a breath on the face of this earth. And He seeks after them. He left the 99 that were safe and went after the one. The shepherd is the hero of the story. The next section that we have tells of a woman who is lost, who has ten coins. She has lost one of those coins and she seeks after that coin. Let's notice a couple of things about this woman. Uh, let, let's think about some things in historic context. There was not electricity. There was no way to go and flip on a light switch or get out a flashlight and look for the lost coin. During these times, and it may have been even during some of your lifetimes, that during the day, only sunlight lit the house. There was not a light switch, so there was dark corners, there was dark sections because there were no overhead lighting. There was no electricity. So what happens is this. People had lamps. Generally from olive oil or rendered fat. But lamp fuel was precious. The lamp Fuel was only used at night. It was not used during the day. They relied on sunlight. It was general, for the average person, it was not used during the day. Early, very early in the morning, very late in the day, and at night. This woman went to great expense to seek out this lost coin. She did something out of the ordinary. She did something that was against tradition. She did something that was against convention. She lit a lamp and she searched her home. She took a broom and she swept the corners. She sought diligently for this coin. When we talk about this parable being the parable of the lost coin, the lost coin has done nothing. The lost coin is just sitting in a corner somewhere. The hero of the story is the woman. The woman goes and she diligently seeks. I am not the most organized person in all the world. Sometimes I have issues. Susan is very organized. If she sees me cleaning, you know what it means? I lost something. It means I lost something. It means something that I needed at that moment I could not find. Yesterday, we were getting ready for the funeral at the fire department. And I was looking for some badges for my uniform. And... Hannah came in there and she goes, what are you doing? I had, 
my nightstand drawer on my side? Hannah said, Susan said, Lord help us. My nightstand on my drawer on my side, I'm just going to give you a, a, a brief overview of the contents of, of, of that drawer. Uh, I have a plastic bag full of almost a hundred keys. I'm afraid to throw them away because it might be something I need. I've got a plastic bag full of keys. Uh, in that drawer, in, in that drawer, there is a piece of a military rifle from the 1940s that I haven't reinstalled back on the rifle yet. In that drawer, there are fishing lures. In that drawer, there are pocket knives. There are flashlights. Notice the plural. Uh, in that drawer, there are receipts. In that drawer was the pins that I needed for my uniform. So yesterday, when it was getting time for me to get those, you know how I found them? I took the drawer out. And I dumped it out on the bed. Susan was not at home. <laughs> but, now I but now you know. I dumped it out on the bed. I scattered the things out till I found what I was looking for because it was valuable to me. It was something that I needed. I, I kind of had an idea. The woman knew the coin was in the house, but she didn't know where in the house. I knew my pen was in that drawer, but I didn't know where in that drawer. I took everything out of that drawer. I dumped it, and I started just, you know, sorting through it, found what I needed, put it on my uniform. I raked all that stuff back up, put it back in the drawer, and put the drawer back up. <laughs> didn't organize the drawer. I just put it back. But here's the point. The coin is just a coin. It was the person seeking after the coin that's important. For God so loved the world. We talked about that to everybody. Let's go a little bit farther. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is desperately seeking the lost this morning. God is desperately seeking the wayward this morning. Now let's move on to the last one. The parable is told that a man has two sons. One of the sons, the younger son, comes to him and says, Dad, give me my inheritance. Now I want you to think about this for just a moment. I want you to think about the context of this for just a moment. Dad, I know what's best about my life. I can't wait until you die so give me what's mine now. Everything we see about the son is selfish. He doesn't think about his father. He only thinks of himself. The son is not the hero in this story. The Bible says that the father gave him his inheritance. You know why he gave him everything? Because he loved him. You see, God loves you this morning with a love that we can't even begin to imagine. When we look at this story, when we look at this parable, it makes absolutely no sense. 
Because those, are, those who have children, you realize that if you give them everything, they will go stupid. They will. They don't have the wisdom. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the appreciation of the effort that it took to obtain it. They will go stupid. So it doesn't make sense to us. God gave sinners everything. For God so loved the world that He... What's that next word? Gave. His only begotten Son. God gave sinners everything. Knowing, knowing, knowing that we would go stupid. The Father gave the Son just what He asked for. And in His wisdom, He knew that things would go bad. Jesus goes on to tell the parable, and the parable goes on like this, that in just a few short days, the Son left. And He went into a foreign country, and He spent all that He had. And the Bible describes it in that He spent it in ways that were not profitable. He spent it on sinful things. He spent it on things that were not good. And He found Himself in a place of need. He found Himself in a place of need. And the Son came, the Bible says, the Son came to His senses and He said, even my Father's servants have it better than I have it. I want you to notice something about the love of God this morning. God loves you so much, but He will not force you to love Him. He gives us a choice. This young man had to get to a place where he said, I know what my father has and I need that. He didn't force his son. You see, he could have said, son, you can't go anywhere. You have no free will. You have no choice in the matter. I'm going to force you to stay here. If the father would have forced the son to do that, would the son voluntarily love and appreciate the father? He would have resented it. He would have hated it. God does not force you to love him. You can't stop His love for you. His love is infinite. His love gives all. His love forgives all. You can't stop God from loving you, but He doesn't make you love Him. He gives us a free choice. The Father gave this Son a free choice. He went out and He lived an unrighteous life. He came to His senses. He came back home. But let's notice something about the Father. When the son left, and I'm reading between the lines here just a little bit, but when the son left, he didn't slam the door behind him and said, I'm so glad he's gone. I imagine he wept. And the way the story and the parable is written, it says that the father was looking. He was waiting on his son to love him back. He was waiting on his son to desire a relationship with him. And so he waited. And he was looking for his son. He was anticipating 
the day that His Son returned. It is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is anxiously awaiting sinners. The Son comes back. He starts to get into His apology and Dad says, nope, here's what it is. My Son that was lost is home. I love you and I forgive you. There again, a love that we can't even begin to imagine. Because the son, basically when he left, he said, I hate you, Father. I want what's best for my life. And he left. But yet while he was gone, the father waited on the son. The son comes back. The son starts to apologize. He starts to say, Dad, I did all this. I did this and that. And Dad says, never mind. It's forgiven. You're home. I'm glad you're home. He calls out to the servants. And here's one of the greatest portions in Scripture that we often miss. You know, this morning I've said the, the, the stars of the story are not the sheep, the coin, and the son. The star of the story is... Uh, The shepherd, the woman, and the father. Well, the best supporting actor is the fatted calf. I want you to think about something for just a moment. You cannot fatten a calf overnight. The father anticipated the celebration that was going to take place when his son came home and he was getting the calf ready. You ever thought about that? I didn't think about that till this week. But that calf was getting ready. The father had the calf getting ready. You can't fatten the calf overnight or instantaneously. That father was preparing the return of his son. And he was ready for a celebration. In the previous two parables... It says that there's more rejoicing in heaven when one sinner comes to repentance. But I want you to understand something. Look at the mathematical progression. The sheep, it was one in a hundred. The coins, it was one in ten. The sun, it was one in two. The shepherd sought the woman saw it. The father waited. This morning, the Holy Spirit is speaking to hearts this morning. It doesn't matter if you've never been saved, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, today is the day. Come home. Maybe you have been saved. Maybe you are a believer, but you have wandered far away from home. The Holy Spirit is compelling your heart. The Holy Spirit is drawing you this morning. The Holy Spirit is seeking after you. And the Father is waiting on you to come home. I've told this story a dozen times through the years and I'm going to tell it again and we're going to close the service. When I was 16 years old, I wrecked my car. And I mean I wrecked my car. I was still able to drive it home but the tires were like this. One whole side was caved in. There was nothing left of the car. Dad always told me, he said, If you ever wreck this car, you won't get another one. If you ever wreck this car, you're going to pay the difference in the insurance. You wreck this car, and it's bad. I ran my car off the road that day coming home from work. Somehow, I was able to get it back out on the road. Two bikers stopped and helped me pull trees out of the bumper. You know, it was bad. 
And after I got the car out of the ditch and the trees out of the bumper and the guys left, they said, are you okay? I said, yeah, and they left me alone. The reality set in that I had to go home and tell Daddy. I drove home slower than I probably ever drove in my life. Number one, because the car was about to fall apart. Number two, because I was scared. I was afraid of Daddy. Turned off the main road and turned on the dirt road and turned in the driveway and I turned in the driveway and I didn't see Dad. His truck was at home, but I didn't see him. I went in the house and he wasn't in the house and I came back out the front door and I started walking around the house and, and the more steps I took, the more dread I had. I was sick. I rounded the corner of the house and Dad was out in a little utility building he had out there doing something with the lawnmower. And I went out there and tears in my eyes. I said, Daddy, I wrecked my car. I was expecting the hammer to come down. I was expecting the wrath of my dad. And tears were just flowing. He said, are you okay? I said, yeah, but I, I tore the car all to pieces, Daddy. I said, the car is just, the car is ruined. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Daddy knows nothing about being a body man and fixing cars and things like that, but he picked up a piece of a two by four and a hammer. And we walked around the house and he didn't say anything. He got up under the fender well of the front fender there and he put that two by four up in there and he started beating that fender well out with a hammer. It still looked horrible, but it looked better than it did. He went back to the back wheel and he done the same thing because that whole passenger side's just caved in. He did the same thing. I was expecting wrath, but I received grace and mercy. Folks, God loves you. He hates your sin. Your sin put His Son Jesus on a cross. And He gave His life and He rose again the third day for you. God hates your sin, but God loves you. He loves you more than we can even wrap our minds around. Is it time for you to come home this morning? Maybe you've wandered far away from home. And maybe somewhere in the back of your mind you're expecting wrath. And God is a God of wrath, but God, first of all, is a God of love and a God of long-suffering. He's very, very patient with His children. Come home this morning. There's a celebration waiting. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.